Welcome to the Birth Journeys Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Hoff, BSN RN. I am a wife, a mother of two, and a nurse specializing in the care of women and newborns. In this podcast, we will share powerful journeys of birth givers with the goals of lifting the veil on the birth experience, healing through sharing, and beginning an open conversation to strengthen trust and promote transparency between birthing people and healthcare providers. Hello. Today, I have with me Anna Gates. Anna is a first-time mom and has a history of deep vein thrombosis. That means that she has had a blood clot in her veins. This made her pregnancy high risk. Anna shared about her pregnancy in episode 10. So if you want to hear about everything that happened before she gave birth, go back and give that a listen. If you want to understand more about deep vein thrombosis and the risks in pregnancy, Listen to my bonus episode where Mike Goldstein talks about hematologic changes of pregnancy. Today, Anna is here to share her birth experience with us, and she's brought a fun guest that was there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anna, welcome, and thank you for joining me. Hey, Kelly. How you doing? Oh, Good. and he's, he's making his presence known he as is. we speak. Little yeah. buddy. Yeah, so this is baby George. Hi, George. And he is six weeks old, and he's currently having an afternoon snack. They're trying to. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we are all about the multitasking mamas. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, I am really excited to hear how everything went down because it sounds like it was pretty exciting. Yeah. So I was induced at 40 weeks, and size was looking good. Every All the vitals were looking good. Everything was great. I was just pretty much done. And I was 40 weeks and I talked to my doctor. And so we scheduled an induction and we head in. Everything's great. Get started. They started with Pitocin. I'm on it for about three, four hours. And they started noticing that his heart rate was dropping just subtly after each contraction, maybe about 10 beats a minute. And he was hovering around like in the 150 range and dropping down to like 140, 130 range. And so like nothing dangerous, but you know, it wasn't like plummeting. It was just kind of suddenly dropping, just kind of showing signs. He's getting a little stressed. And so I wasn't really progressing. I hit like three, four centimeters. I'm like six hours in, I'm not progressing. His heart rate's suddenly dropping a little bit more. And it's really, really bummed. Nobody wants an unexpected C-section. And so my doctor stepped out of the room and the nurses, so my husband and I talked about the risks associated and everything. And I'm like, you know, how long do we keep going? Should we go for this now? And while we were talking, his heart rate dropped in the 60 range. And I was like, okay, well, uh, that's my decision. I guess we're having a C-section right now. And so scared the crap out of me. And they had stopped the Pitocin too, because obviously it was causing issues. So, I mean, we're just trying to figure out what to do. And so when his heart rate dropped that one time, my eyes, you know, just kind of bulged at the side of the monitor. And because I pretty much was glued to it the whole time at this point when I hear, oh, <laughs> you might be getting stressed. You, you can't help yourself. And so went in for a C-section, was probably in there within 15 minutes. And I had also, I got my epidural put in before they broke my water. And so that was already in place before the C-section. So the epidural was uneventful. The anesthesiologist was very speedy. Um, no issues. So other than, hey, her baby's getting really stressed out as our rate's dropping, you need a C-section for that. He came out and he was 9 pounds and 12 ounces and 22 inches long and healthy as could be. No issues. Perfectly healthy after that. Just had a very dramatic entrance. So, so that's. Did they I'm... say that it was because of his size that he was? Ha did they ever decide why he was having the late? D they're, they're called late D cells when they come after the contraction. Even if they're subtle, it starts to s tell us that there's something going on. Well, they. I mean, obviously he was a very large size, but also I found out, and I don't know if I'm saying this right, Polly. Hydramnios. Mm -hmm. I had too much amniotic fluid and yeah. apparently I had a lot. And so that was also adding a complication where he had, I guess, a lot of extra room, but he had the cord was by his head. And apparently he was also holding on to the cord. Oh. So 
he he was just locked in there. <laughs> he yeah, he was down. causing all those things to happen. Yes. <laughs> so he was like, uh, I did not say I was ready. So yeah. That's, yes. That's that's what I was told. Yeah. So the umbilical cord is kind of just basically their blood supply. So mm-hmm. it's like it's like if he's holding on to it, mm-hmm. he's cutting off his own blood supply. Mm-hmm. So so yeah. he's just like making himself pass out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Whoa, what is that? A squeeze. Yeah. And then yeah. it's like he's probably holding on long enough that he yeah. starts to like pass out and then he yeah. can't hold on anymore because he's passing <laughs> out and then he lets go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> he has no idea that he's doing it to himself. Yeah. yeah. And if it's up by his head, kind of, it yeah. could, sometimes I'm not sure I wasn't there, but it, sometimes that can be called an occult cord. So if they break your water, there's a whole lot of amniotic fluid. They're they're going to do it when they're relatively sure that the head is down low enough that it's not going to make the cord fall into the area before mm-hmm. the head, like in front of the head, between the head and the birth canal. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not always 100% scientific. That, you know, gravity and all that baby moving, there's a whole bunch of different factors going in there. So possibly what happened, it sounds like when they went in for the C-section, they saw that the cord was like in a place that's close enough to the head that with each contraction, it was also getting squeezed. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) he had two strikes against him there. Yeah. And then additionally being enormous. Yeah. (laughs) I was shocked when you told me the size. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. They had guessed like early at my first anatomy scan that the estimated size was like eight pounds, two ounces or eight, four or something like that. And I was like, okay, so it's going to be good size, you know, and I mean, I was nine four when I was born. And so, I mean, I thought, oh my gosh, as long as I'm not that big or he doesn't come out that big, <laughs> he ends up yeah. just blowing that out of the water. So, yeah, he was a 10 pounder pretty much right when he came out. Daddy. So, did your mom have to have a C section? No, no, oh, uh, she had a okay. vaginal birth. Yeah. Wow. How tall are you? I'm five eight. Okay. Huh. Yeah. I wonder then um, if it had more to, it probably had more to do with the cord and yeah. than his size maybe. Yeah. I think so because they, they said, I really don't like where that cord's at. I, I could hear yeah. them saying that quite a bit. So I think that had quite a bit to do with it. So was that before or after Did they notice kind of something funky before with the cord? Yeah. After he, they broke his water. Yeah. Right after. Water? Yeah. Right after my doctor broke my water, she commented she didn't like where the cord was. So oh, gotcha. That sounds pretty inevitable. Yeah. Yeah, I know there was a lot of talking and at that point, it was kind of like a blur. And I've I've tried to go back and remember what was discussed. But it was just kind of like, you know, you're taking in a lot of information, you're feeling weird, you're getting stressed too. And you're trying to stay calm and you're trying to think through things rationally. And so a lot of the information I even asked, him, I was like, do you remember what they said this or when this happened? He's like, no, like he's trying to, you know, it's such a blur. Well, they're speaking another language too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's a lot. It was such a blur. Yeah. So you had the C-section. Did Mm -hmm. he cry right away when he came out? Yep. Nice. Yep. Good boy. Yeah. I felt like I was holding my breath and obviously everything feels like it's takes so much longer. Looking back, I'm like, oh, wow. Like I wasn't in there that long. You think it's forever and it's just seconds. And I asked my husband, I was like, oh, how long was he here? And he was like, he was there for this amount of time. And I was like, really? Like, it felt like this amount of time was so distorted. But he came out, so they lowered the window, they probably lowered it a little early. So my husband actually saw him getting pulled out. He saw oh the hand, he saw the hand come out first. And so he got to see a whole lot more of the process than expected. He handled it well, he was just fine. So and then they held the baby up. And then he started doing what they do that I can't I couldn't see. And all of a sudden, we heard a wail. And at that point, you're just crying because you can't control yeah. anything. I was shaking. Nope. I think I was like vibrating off the table. I was shaking yeah. really, really hard. I was chattering <laughs> and shaking. And I heard something about Demerol, like going after my after I delivered because I I think I had Demerol. Yeah, I was shaking really hard. Yeah, and my teeth were just chattering away with the anesthesia, and but that's what they said. And so I was doing it the whole time, and and coincidentally, I found out later I had an allergic reaction to the surgical tape that had oh, the, the epidural which i've never had an allergic reaction to anything i mean other oh, than other like, than um estrogen yeah other than sorry yeah estrogen, <laughs> i guess and, actually that probably was an allergic yeah. allergic reaction was, yeah but, not so much an allergy but yeah an intolerance to it but yeah i don't have any food allergies i'm you very fortunate i'm like allergic to animals and seasonal allergies but 
so the next day I was like really itchy and they're like that's the anesthesia and I'm like no my back is like really itchy like my back and they look and now it's like screaming hot red strips where oh. the tape was and I was so they had to give me a steroid cream too because I was oh my god I was flaming red hot marks down my back from the the surgical tape and they tried so hard to find out what kind they I was like what is this I would like to know not to use this ever again and they could not track. They couldn't figure it out. So anyway, wow, no such luck there. Did you didn't have an you didn't have it on the IV site? Though, no, did you? it was because I know they will put a tegaderm, which is the clear tape, mm-hmm. over the epidural, and then after that, whatever tape they use is just the physician. Preference. Yeah, that's what they said. Is so. it like they couldn't track it down to figure out exactly what type that he had used? Yeah in the surgery but yeah the IV was fine but that's just a coincidental thing of that happened that was such a random thing I was like my back's itchy they're like that's anesthesia and I was like I don't know it feels very specific I feel very very itchy did you just scratch my back can you just look at my back so after that yeah we went into recovery for a few hours and I mean I was really numb so they put him on my chest and obviously it was really bummed because he went skin to skin and all this other stuff and they were Really, I mean, they got down to business and they brought him over to me like as soon as possible, which they make a huge effort to get the baby in skin to skin contact with you, especially after a C-section. So I got to have him a little bit there in the operating room. They brought him over for a little bit. And then in recovery, they pretty much put him up on my chest the whole time. And he did, he did great. And they cut the cord. But when they went over, they kind of ceremoniously, when they trimmed it down, they let my husband cut the cord still. And mm-hmm. I, I was like, I didn't see any of that. I didn't know any of that was going on. So yeah. When we came home, I was like, okay, tell me your experience because we obviously had very different, you know, experiences. I'm I'm in there getting prepped for surgery. I thought he was in there and he just wasn't close by, but he was still out in the hallway. I didn't know where he was. It was just – and so they brought him in. He goes, come in. I see you strapped to a table. It's like very – it's upsetting and it's like, oh, my God. And there's a million people in there too. I walk in and I just see all these people and I'm like, well – I am very naked in front of a lot of people I don't know. And I don't know everyone. I don't care. Hello. Hi, everybody. So we, we chatted about it later because I'm like, I have no idea what your experience was like because, you know, it, it was so different. And so, but he was explaining to me everything they were doing to the baby when I was still the tail and I couldn't see anything. So I was like, oh, I'm glad one of us got to see. Yeah. Did they let him take any pictures? No, they, they didn't. Oh. No, he, no phone or anything like that in there. So, wow. yeah. So no pictures. Every place is different. Yeah. Um, so it, but where I work, we don't do skin to skin in the OR, but you can take pictures. Yeah. <laughs> it just, you know, every hospital has a different policy. Yeah. The nurse pretty much held him to my chest and my neck, my face. She just stood there holding him on me mm-hmm. for a while. He said maybe like a minute and then they, they had to take him, but instantly in recovery, he's on me. So well, that's good. I'm glad you got to do that. How was your recovery after that? Was it a challenge to get up and walk? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. How do you even explain it? It's just like in the hospital, because I was there four days and three nights. And the first couple of days, you feel great because you're still on really good painkillers. And you're like, oh, I don't feel so bad. C-section isn't that bad. And then they stop them and then you feel things a lot more and you're like, oh God, I'm walking hunched over. I, I had wonderful nurses in, they called the mother and baby unit mm-hmm. and they helped me up going to the bathroom the first time after they take out the catheter and just cleaning me up and just very compassionate and kind. And you're just, I can't, you can barely move. And so mm-hmm. you're like, oh, I need to pull up my underwear but you can't someone's pulling up underwear for me great okay that's where I'm at Mm -hmm. so you're so sore you you're trying to coordinate and move things that aren't moving the way they normally do and trying to get up and down out of bed you're trying to nurse and even like eating and trying to sit up in the bed and position yourself not to spill on yourself like I felt like I was Nothing no, moves, right? and it's supposed to do this, and you're just like, why is it so hard to just to mm-hmm. pull up like that? So I had a laparoscopic removal of my gallbladder when I was 15, and that was otherwise the only surgery I've ever had. So it was an unfamiliar feeling. Yeah, like every single little movement, because yeah. it's your abdomen. Yeah. You know, they slice through all those muscles and through a major organ and then they repair a major organ and then they repair those mm-hmm. muscles. And that's, I mean, it's major surgery and then they expect you to take care of a baby. I know. Afterwards. Yeah. I thought, you know, he's delivered. I'm in my mind. I'm like, I'm done. Why aren't they letting me go back? And I'm like, oh, wait, I'm probably being, I couldn't feel anything. So I'm like, oh, I'm probably being stitched together right now. I'm completely unaware of it. 
But I was kind of like, oh, great, we're all done. And I'm waiting for them to take me. I'm like, oh, wait. It takes a lot yeah. longer to put you back Everybody together. else is over. <laughs> he's holding the baby. They had the baby under the warmer. And I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go back. And I'm just like, what's taking so long? And I'm like, oh, yeah, they're probably putting me back together right now. And I'm totally unaware. So yeah, do you want me to tell you what they were doing? Yes, actually, that'd be great. So your uterus is in between your other abdominal organs, specifically closest to your intestines in your bladder. So they make sure that there's no damage, no visible damage to those organs. They also they take your uterus out of your abdomen and look on the back part of it to make sure that there's no tear or incision that was accidentally oh, okay. made or any damage to the backside of your uterus or just anything that would be concerning. So the first C-section I saw, I had to leave the room because I didn't realize they're going to remove the uterus. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's attached, yeah. but it flips. You can flip yeah. it forward and look at the entire thing. You can hold it in your hands, but that's what they do. And for good reason, because they want to make sure that they're putting back an organ that is intact. So, and then they put it back and then they start sewing up all your different layers. And then most facilities, they're, they're going to count the instruments and what we call the lap tapes, which are the sponges that they use to clean and to and stop bleeding and stuff like that. They count all of that to make sure that nothing was left in any of the layers. So Good. they do multiple counts. I don't know if you heard them counting in the OR, but mm-hmm. they start off with one count to make sure that they know how many were there. They yeah. write it down. And then several times mm-hmm. during the mm-hmm. case, they go back and make sure they didn't leave anything inside of you. So not only are they carefully putting you back together, they're also carefully making sure that nothing was inadvertently left behind. In yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, that's important. <laughs> and then if the count comes back incorrect, they have to go back and try to find it. If it's not there, they'd call in an x-ray to make oh, sure boy. it's not in there. Yeah, <laughs> that didn't happen. So I think they got everything. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah. They did, it sounds like, yeah. (laughs) And then they get you all cleaned up afterwards. And then the part that you probably remember is they take down the drapes and then they move you over to the recovery table and take Yeah, I remember getting wheeled out. But when I go, and it's so foggy when I try to think about it, I know it happened and I kind of remember it, but I was super foggy at that point, so. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you said they gave you Demerol, so uh-huh. <laughs> that'll do it. Yeah, I don't. I remember just saying something about Demerol, and then after that, I'm like, this is really fuzzy. Yeah, bye. bye. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so you got up and you started walking. You mentioned that it was hard to stand up mm-hmm. straight. So usually I tell, I kind of warm moms when they're standing up. I'm like, what you want to do is stand up with your legs and then kind of ease mm-hmm. your way up. Because the more you stretch those muscles, the easier it's going to be later because they're kind of just trying to figure out where they're supposed to be. So if you hunch forever, you're going to have like really tight muscles. Yeah, they were very encouraging of me. Obviously, you can just want to curl up and not move and be really immobile because it feels better. But the more you move, the better you're going to recover. So they were very encouraging to kind of take little walks like around and just hold on the rail and stand up, sit and move. And the first time they're like, okay you're probably going to feel this in your legs. And it's going to feel like this. The first time they're like, you're going to feel a lot better than you really are. So just be careful. And when I came off the mat, they're like, okay, now we're going to do this. It's going to feel different this time. They're with assistance of kind of helping me up. And it was definitely a lot of encouragement. You know, the more you do this, the faster you're going to recover. Easier said than done. (laughs) Yeah. So So especially for you, since you have the history of DVD blood clots, Mm -hmm. it's it was definitely, oh, yeah, you know, getting you up and moving is very, very important. Oh, yeah. They had special compression stocks hooked to the bed, which I was like, oh, I don't even remember those being put on. Like, I don't even, I, I don't know when they did that. They probably did it in the OR when you were already numb. Probably. Yeah, I didn't even know. Like, they were just already on there. They were constantly checking my legs, which I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with, at least with that part, because I've already experienced that part. So I was, yeah, they were very attentive to that. I went back on Lovenox because they had me on heparin leading up to it. So they put me back on Lovenox once I was in my regular room and they were constantly checking my legs, encouraging me to move, walk. So that I was expecting it was a very slow yeah. walk around the ward of you're like, oh, this is, I'm doing really good. And you're like, I can't. I even imagine how slow I'm actually walking right now. So (laughs) how was the transition to taking care of baby with all of that going on? I think it was kind of trippy because the nurses handle baby so confidently and expertly that (laughs) they they're changing a diaper like crazy fast and putting things on and then let me do the hat, let me do the swaddle and 
they do the bath. Care the baby's first bath was done while we were there. And they do it in the room so you can kind of see. And so you see them do it and you're like, oh, okay. And then you do it and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to break his legs. I'm going to break his arm. I am. He's going <laughs> to slip. I'm going to drop him. He's so slippery. You just feel like you're trying to move, hold his neck. For me, it was just, it'd been a long time since I held a baby. So I was like, oh my God, they are so tiny and fragile. And then the nurses are like getting stuff on, doing stuff so fast. So it was, see them doing, you're like, oh, that looks easy. And then you do it and you're like, oh my God. So how do they make it look so easy? I know. They, like they do this all the time, like at the exact same age. They deal with newborns constantly. So I seeing them do a lot of, they did a lot of stuff up front and it gave me a lot of false confidence <laughs> that I did it. I was like, oh, okay. So, but they were very helpful in getting started. A lactation consultant came in every day. They had a massage therapist that worked on the floor that came in and gave me a complimentary neck and shoulder massage. Wow. I know. They had fresh baked cookies every day that they brought around all the moms, oatmeal cookies and stuff. Wow. So it was, it was a great experience there. I felt like I had a lot of support. We had a lot of the same nurses kind of, I mean, we're there a little bit longer. And so had repeat nurses and that was just really reassuring. And so I, I think it there, again, it gave me a lot of confidence in the beginning and then kind of getting home. It was like, oh my God, what are we, what are we doing? <laughs> the nurses don't go home with you? Who <laughs> let us take this child? <laughs> we are unsupervised. That quickly became a, a lot of going back and we we took a baby care class through the hospital and it was like an eight hour class it was a couple that was great because it was some of the basic stuff of like how to change a diaper and but it was also covering you doing a bath and what your baby's poop should look like if it looks like this you have a problem if you have a fever like this it's a problem you know so it's kind of like it was a good get you started class and so I was like okay sure and then we got home with the baby I was like I forgot everything I don't know anything I know nothing how did I even get here and and so went back and reviewed a lot of materials and just trying to remember as much as possible and remember what the nurses did. And so I would say there was a little bit of a learning curve, a little bit of panic the first week. And my husband was also able to take off. So I'm home on leave right now. And he took the first two and a half weeks off of work. And then his le his official parental leave will start when mine ends. So he but he was fortunately able to just take two and a half weeks of vacation. And I don't know how I would have done that without him recovering from a c-section when he went back to work i was really panicked because he did he did a lot i mean he brought up all my food like i mean everything a lot of up and down and we have our bedroom is on the second floor so it, there were stairs it was an issue as well so and you move very slowly on those are you pregnant and planning a hospital birth you don't need a birth plan you need a birth vision in my opinion, birth plans set you up for failure. Yep, I said it. Hear me out before you turn off this podcast. You may think that by downloading a generic birth plan, it means you're in control. The truth is it's not that simple. No one can control exactly how their birth will go. There are way too many variables. What every pregnant person wants is to walk into the hospital pregnant and to walk out with a healthy newborn in their arms. The journey in between is the murky part. It's hard to know what issues might come up that need to be addressed. If you focus your energy on a birth vision rather than giving your power to a birth plan, you can empower yourself to make the best choices for you and your baby. That's why you need to get into my Empowered Hospital Birth Program. As a labor nurse and mindset coach, I can help guide you through the process of maintaining the calm autonomy that will help you achieve the birth vision you desire. In my Empowered Hospital Birth Program, I will help you identify the source of anxiety you have surrounding hospital birth. Fill in knowledge gaps to make sure that you are fully informed and confident. Learn key phrases so you can better communicate with your medical team. Emotionally process your fears so that they don't hold power over you. Go to kellyhoff.com backslash empowered to book a free 30-minute private birth vision call where we will identify your top fears and must-haves and gain clarity on exactly how you want to feel in the birth space. That's K-E-L-L-Y-H-O-F dot com backslash empowered. I'm honored to be a part of your birth journey. <laughs> C-section. Yeah, well, and they did, they probably told you not to be climbing stairs a lot. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so you have to kind of commit to one level. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of 
stationed upstairs and I did very little stair climbing that day. So I mean, he he really took care of everything and that made it a lot easier. But I mean, everything is kind of a learning curve because they change so quickly, especially when they're this tiny. So just kind of like when you think you you have it down. I throw you a curveball. <laughs> yeah. Now we're like looking at, oh, we're at our first appointment. And like, they're talking about milestones. I'm like, I haven't been paying attention. <laughs> am I, am I my paying milestones? Attention? <laughs> How many times have you done this? I'm like, oh my God. I, I'm supposed to be counting. So anyway, I'm kind of settling in a little bit. And we're just trying to get a schedule now. And I'm feeling a little bit better. I still feel kind of just like stiff. And I'm trying to move around more. But you're like, oh, maybe we should go for a walk and it's zero degrees outside. Never mind. So January in Chicago is a little chilly. So mm-hmm. I feel mostly recovered in terms of critical right after surgery stuff. But, you know, you still don't feel. It takes a while to get to 100%. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. So then you've been breastfeeding since he was born. Mm-hmm. How was that at the beginning and how's it going? It took quite a while for my milk to come in, which they warned me up front that I might have that experience with the C-section. And I think it took pretty much like around like five days or so, four or five days-ish from what I remember. And they told me to do with like the colostrum, but he did drop a lot of weight. He dropped about a whole pound while we were at the hospital still. So I had to see the pediatrician the day after we were discharged because at that point, I mean, again, he still weighed almost nine pounds, but he lost a pound in like four days. So they had me supplement a little, or they started supplementing with formula on, I can't remember exactly what point in the hospital they started adding formula and you, you feel really bummed, you know, because you put a lot of pressure on yourself. I, I mean, maybe... I shouldn't speak for everyone, but I was feeling like I really wanted to, to breastfeed and feel like there's a lot of pressure to, to do that. And so, you know, I kind of was feeling a bit of a failure because I, I want to do this. I can't do this. Why can't I do this? So that was really frustrating every time they had to bust out the formula. And um, so that was hard, but they had me still latching. Yeah, but you were doing it. That's the thing. You were doing it. Yeah, I was doing it. Yeah. You just had some training wheels to get you through the... F- first day because your body just didn't get the message with a c-section your baby doesn't come out the exit that (laughs) is designed to come out yeah so the body doesn't get that feedback that the baby was delivered and it's like are you sure are you sure we need to release the milk right now so you know we have a little backup to get you through a couple of days but you're still doing it yeah you didn't fail it was just a little bumper to get you through and i i mean we've had a supplement with formula i didn't have it at first but i started having a lot of nipple pain so i was just having a really hard time with keeping up with how hungry he was too i feel like the frequency and i was like oh my gosh i'm in so much pain and this so bad and it's gotten better but he was also eating every two hours a hungry monster and he easily put that all that weight back on now he's around 11 pounds now so and our one month appointment he put all of those weight back on and then some and he had grown another inch and a half so he, he's making up for it that that pound that he lost but so he was 23 and a half inches and a little over 10 pounds at our appointment so wow. that was a relief knowing he's getting enough because also just wondering is he getting enough how do you know it's really challenging and especially when you you want to make sure that you're doing things the right way and you want to make sure your baby is full and babies are very instinctual they will let you know. If they need more, they'll let you know. If they're done, they'll stop. They're not going to stop if they are starving. So like, I want to calm down, trust the process and notice that you know, when he is done, you know, he lets go and kind of fades out and dozes off. And I'm like, okay, I like I <laughs> so learning what his cues are and now that it's okay and he's obviously gaining weight he's obviously getting bigger his clothes are getting tighter he's obviously getting enough so just trying to appease my worry about that yeah I mean if if you were needing to supplement a hundred years ago you would have had a wet nurse so it's not like right it's not like this is unheard of Mm -hmm. it it happened It, it was very common for people to rely on other people to help make sure that their baby got food. And in addition to that, there was this whole village that would help. Mm -hmm. You probably would have been exposed to this more because you'd Mm -hmm. have friends and sisters and all these women around where you'd see all this. And so you're kind of having to learn in a vacuum right now. Yeah. 
how everything works. And it's just kind of the weird way that our society is set up right now that's just so unnatural that makes people feel like they're doing the wrong thing when they're just doing our version of what we've been doing to survive for right since right. the beginning of time. It's just unfortunate that everybody has to yeah. feel so inadequate when they're just being normal. Absolutely. Yeah, it's I thought kind of going in for years that I will never get never girl. I'm going to do this naturally. I'm going to, you know, it's almost like a badge of honor, something to prove. And it's like, Mm-hmm. I think you had said, would you go to the dentist without anesthesia? And I was like, oh, my God, no, that's insane. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I don't have to. We have modern medicine. If you have a procedure done and, you know, they numb you up beforehand. I'm like, that's insane that you would endure something like that without anesthesia or without numbing or something like that. They're like, why Why would you do that? Mm-hmm. But for a number of reasons, like, yeah, we, we have so many advancements. You know, I probably wouldn't have made it. I probably would have had a massive blood clot early on and I probably wouldn't have survived childbirth if, or even being pregnant if I were this several hundred years ago, you know. So I take blood thinner. I obviously have to accommodate medical intervention and we've come a long way. So that just makes sense. So comparing what you think you're supposed to do versus taking a minute and thinking about it and you're like wait a minute but it's there for a reason it's good so it's helpful we've come this far from what we used to do and maybe what we used to do before wasn't necessarily the only way yeah it's good to have options Mm -hmm. i'm so happy that it went well and that you're progressing going in the right direction and getting your confidence and all that stuff yeah he's growing so feeling good about that you know he's a cutie pie and but it's ebbs and flows you're feeling real good about certain things other times you're like um also i don't know what we would do without the internet or google can like a lot of the moms that were maybe giving birth in the 80s that i've talked to or 70s and they're like oh yeah there was none of that one of my neighbors mentioned that after she gave birth to her first child i think it was like sometime mid 80s and she she delivered and she didn't know anything about postpartum like nobody tells you anything you know, postpartum care. And here she is after birth bleeding. And she told her husband she needed pads. So he goes to the store and he brings home a box of panty liners after she delivered her first baby. And she was in tears. It's not cut it. No, it's not. She is sobbing. I can't go to the store. Her husband doesn't understand what she's talking about. I'm like, oh my God, we've come a long way. I, I can't imagine, you know, now I'm like, I could Google what's the ideal postpartum. They make kits for that. I had the whole thing. I had the whole thing ready to go. I was so prepared. Of course, I had a C-section. I was so prepared. Yeah. <laughs> and it's There's still useful yeah. stuff in there. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> what will we do without Google and all yeah. the sites and everybody? And Amazon. Yes. Oh, my God. Life-saving. So that stuff really, really helps. Have you started pumping at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I got the set up with a pump through insurance. They had me do all that stuff. I think you have to do it within 60 days of your due date or something I can't even remember that now but a pump showed up at my house and <laughs> it was really intimidating and they had me do it at the hospital as well and showed me and they actually had a very abbreviated easy how-to guide to get started with my exact model at home I have like a spectra nice so like a, I think a very common one so that yeah. that took a lot of the intimidation out of it but I've been pumping I know I need to do more but I was Like I said, I was in a lot of pain. So I was kind of like, I just want them to be left alone. And I know I need to do it more. I mean, not necessarily. If your supply is okay Mm -hmm. at this point, you can kind of relax a little bit and make sure that you get your groove, like make sure that he's latching comfortably and, you know, get that stuff taken care of first, for sure. Yeah. Before you worry about the pumping. Yeah, I'd say, you know, we're probably still supplementing with formula, maybe about two to three times a day still, but sometimes it might not be very much. Because mm-hmm. again, every two hours, I was like, I cannot have anything touching my nipple right now. So we're kind of phasing that out, like getting better. So still need a little bit of formula, but I'm just trying not to put too much pressure on myself to, mm-hmm. yeah, your baby is going to, yeah, no exactly. <laughs> That's more important than, than my, than my right. pride. But yeah, pumping is interesting, but I'm getting the hang of it a little bit more. So, and it's been successful. Do you have leaking on one side when you're breastfeeding on the other? No. It doesn't, I, I have okay. one that starts to leak when I think they call that letdown. My milk comes mm-hmm. in and it like, it's coming out no matter what. And then the other mm-hmm. side does not really do that that much. And then I usually start on the side that's ready to go. And then mm-hmm. the other one is fine. If you're concerned at all about just collecting, I think it's called a haka thing. Uh-huh, I have one. 
Yeah. I couldn't coordinate to get that to work for me, but I have no people that just swear by it. And then you put it on the one that's leaking. I have not used it yet. I've washed it. I've sanitized it, but I have not used it yet. It might help you kind of get while you're working on him latching on the side that is not as forceful. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. (laughs) He can get his coordination down on the side that isn't flowing as much. Oh, that's true. And then you can just collect on the side that's dripping. That's true. And then give that nipple a rest for a little bit. And then switch and if you can put the thing on the other side if it's dripping if yeah. not then don't worry about it but then you've collected a little bit and then instead of mm-hmm. the formula you can feed him right. the stuff that was leaking and see if that starts to just increase the demand mm-hmm. so that your body gets the message and then see if that helps yeah rather than pumping it's true might give your nipples a little bit a tiny break. <laughs> a tiny tiny reprieve uh-huh. tiny break yeah very small yeah oh sorry buddy oh right in the sun sorry i just i lifted up a little bit and the sun is right over my shoulder i just blinded him oh sorry buddy that's no fun my bad my bad buddy i'm like i just blinded him sorry i'm sure it's permanent damage yes he'll live yeah he's he's tucked in now oh did you ever get a lactation consultant that you've been talking to i have i've not called yet so i signed up for the thompson method which is it's an online program and like you can do live sessions with them if you choose to but i I just signed up for this so and i've been following the tutorials and i felt like Mm -hmm. It makes a lot of sense and I can see a lot of the things that I was doing that were causing me more pain. So I felt like when you give that a little bit of shot, but they do have the lactation consultant, like they have like hotline and they're there six days a week and you can set up appointments. So I haven't done that yet. But I have that number like queued up because I kind of want to do what I can to kind of correct. And I realized a lot of things I was doing that I'm like, okay, no wonder this was hurting. But also, if he has the slightest bit of a tongue tie, but I don't know if it's enough to be causing the problem. So I'm like, I want to see if this kind of corrects. And if not, maybe it's more significant than I realized. And I just need to make that appointment and, and take him in. But I was just trying to get the pain down a little bit. Yeah. Well, if it's mm-hmm. working, I mean, that's great. And it's also more convenient to be able to do it without having yeah, to go somewhere. For sure. You know, in the winter. In yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, but I have it ready to go and they, they make appointment like same day appointments and they're very available. So they have quite a few of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I know if I'm really in a pinch, I can get it quickly. Now I'm trying this first before I go to the doctor or to something else, but it's definitely on my radar <laughs> if I need it. That's good. So after going through this experience, the first time we talked, did you feel prepared or is there anything you would go back to tell yourself now that you've been through it? I think going into it, I had so much confidence that I was going to have a vaginal birth. I always knew that a C-section could be a possibility, but I've always been told, oh, you have textbook reproductive system. You've got great hips for this. Oh, you're not going to have any trouble at all. Birth canal looks wonderful. You know, you hear all these things. So I'm just like, I'm not going to be a woman who's going to have that difficulty. I always thought this is just a given. And none of my sisters, well, nobody had a C-section in my family. So I was feeling like even genetically, I'm set up for this. And maybe it was hubris that I <laughs> did not spend as much time just preparing. And so I felt kind of at a loss for questions to ask. So I felt like I spent more time preparing for the traditional vaginal birth and not as much for the C-section. So I felt like I was playing catch up. So I think that's one thing I wish I would have just prepared for both options a little bit more just to ask more questions about the possibility of what could happen when you induce and what are some outcomes. I didn't even know that baby's getting stressed after contractions. You know, obviously, there's like a million things that can go wrong. But I wish I would have known of this happens then this is a possibility or C-section is a possibility. So I just, I felt underprepared for the C-section side of things. Yeah, it didn't really sound like it was your anatomy that was causing the problem. Oh, uh, so, you know, yeah, it sounds like baby had some issues that caused distress mm-hmm. and they had more to do with gravity and where things mm-hmm. fell when the water broke. Yeah. Which even if they had let your water break naturally could have happened. You know, so thank God for modern mm-hmm. medicine that we can do things. And in addition to that, you you didn't think you needed to prepare mm-hmm. for the C-section. It's not something you can tr- control. You're not going to make the universe make you have a C-section, whether you think it's hubris or whether you think right. it's preparing. Right. <laughs> Wherever you fall on that line of jinxing yourself. Yeah. yeah. That's not a thing. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. 
Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I'm yeah. trying to think about it too, is, you know, professionally speaking, I mean, like, that's why I wanted to give birth in a hospital and I wanted to be surrounded with other people who do this all the time because I obviously can't know everything. You know, I'm not in that line of work. I wouldn't expect myself or anybody to know everything or what all the possible outcomes are because that's impossible. But it's, you know, I just, I felt like I should have, I, I wish I would just prepared a little bit more of just like, oh, what are some major yeah. recovery things that would be good for you to have if you have a C-section. And I think one of the things <laughs> that I will say that I was just lucky that while I was preparing for the traditional birth that I thought I was going to have, one of the things somebody suggested was bringing your own pillow from home. And so I brought that and thankfully I had that with me already in the hospital because the advice I got on the car ride home was hold a pillow to your incision and hug the pillow on the car ride home. Ooh. They're like, do you have a pillow? I'm like, I wasn't expecting to have a C-section, but I'm like, oh wait, we started driving and you know, in the parking lot, I was like, oh my God, stop. I was like, I remember that I had my actual pillow and I didn't have one sitting in the car, but anybody who is going to have a C-section have a little, like a firm throw pillow in the car because mm -hmm. that was life changing. I'm like something that small, you wouldn't even think about it, but I just happened to have the pillow from the other advice that I got of like, oh, you're going to want your own pillow. And I was glad I had it just for rest mm -hmm. purposes. But he stopped on the road and actually hopped out and went to the back of the car to grab the pillow again so I could hold it on the car ride home. And that made it tolerable in the car. You know, stuff like that where I was so prepared, like I said, for a vaginal recovery that I, I don't think I was mm -hmm. very prepared that the other alternative. So just be prepared for both. The interesting thing is it's also different hospitals prepare you for different things like mm -hmm. The hospitals that I work at, they give you a pillow. There's like a little travel size pillow that they oh, give Oh, really? Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Then they teach you how to brace your abdomen if you cough or sneeze or laugh or yeah. whatever. And then it's not something that they usually, it's like a take and toss pillow oh, that okay. you can take it home. But I'd never even thought about telling someone to yeah. use it in the car because I haven't, you know, we say goodbye yeah, exactly. in the car. <laughs> I haven't yeah. had a C-section. I've had abdominal surgery and I remember bracing myself, but I don't remember car rides. The car ride to the hospital when I had my appendix out was right. excruciating. Yes. The one coming home isn't yeah. the one that I remember. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's really good. I'll remind people to take that pillow with them. Yeah, um, I think it's especially because you're trying to be really careful with the seatbelt. Like they did tell me kind of like this, but thankfully we had these really good firm Tempur-Pedic pillows that I just happen to have. And so they're really firm. And so I just like clutched it against the incision and in, in my belly and just held it all the way home. And because otherwise it was really painful, like little bumps, yeah, little stops. Yes. All those muscles have to just to hold yourself up. They have to fire and they're not attached anymore. And it does not feel good. Yeah. Like I said, I didn't have that preparation. But mm -hmm. one of my neighbors, she had twins and she had a planned C-section. And that was like her one piece of advice that she mentioned. And mm -hmm. I happened to get that while I was in the hospital. But thankfully, I already had one. Yeah. Otherwise, just have a pillow in the car, whether one way or the other. Just make sure you have yeah. one in the car just in case, because that was really, really big. Yeah. So it was a 45 minute drive home from the hospital. So oh, wow. Yeah. Chicago traffic and, and it was also not super close, but also we're driving home and it was busy. And so stop and go traffic, you know, that sounds like a pillow. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Have it ready to go. So if you mm -hmm. get pregnant mm -hmm. again, if you have another baby, no, don't do it now. Don't plan on it. <laughs> yeah. Give yourself a break. But what do you, I mean, you have some options, mm -hmm. of course. What are your thoughts on trying a vaginal delivery after C-section or just scheduling a repeat C-section? You know, my doctor was going over everything. She obviously sensed my disappointment. She's like, by the way, times have changed. She goes, you have a C-section now? Your second one could have a vaginal birth. She goes, my first one, I had a C-section. My two and three were both vaginal. And she goes, you can 100% have a regular delivery for your next one. So I always thought that once you had a C-section, that's it. You weren't able to have a vaginal delivery. And so that must have been an antiquated notion. I just thought that that's just what you had to do. No, there's just limits. Oh, okay. There's limits to what you can do. There's specific, more specific recommendations for what can and can't be mm -hmm. done during the labor process. Yeah. They usually want you to dilate a little bit on your own. They don't really... Most places, at least where I work, it's contraindicated to do the cervical ripening methods like 
Cervidil. Mm. Some places will mm. do a little bit of Pitocin, but it's facility preference. Yeah. It was just reassuring to know that it's not a foregone conclusion that I had to have a C-section the second time around. So if I'm able, I would really like to be able to compare both <laughs> options. I think that would be just a really interesting experience to be able to say that I've done both. But knowing it's possible mm. is I definitely want to give that a shot if I can. Yeah. And they, their, their parameters are mm. going to be a little bit stricter for when they would go back to a C-section. Sure. So it's going to be a little bit different. But I think that's the only thing you'd have to wrap your head around is they'd be a little bit Mm -hmm. less flexible, I guess, before they have that conversation with you and start bringing up a C-section. But absolutely. I mean, I see it happen pretty regularly Yeah, where people try to deliver naturally and it kind of just depends on your body. But what you would probably do is just there's a point where your provider would no longer want you to wait. Mm -hmm. And then they would probably schedule the C-section for that date that they say you can't go past this date. Right. That's fair. Yeah. I get to know. So yeah, we'll see when that time rolls around. You know, we'd like to have at least one more. That's probably where we'll stop. But I also don't know that I could do another year of Lovenox and Heparin. God, that's just been a pain. Yeah. So I'm supposed to get cleared from that on Thursday. It's my six week appointment. So technically yesterday was six weeks, but my official appointment is on Thursday where I get the green light that I can go off of Lovenox. And I am super excited. Super excited. Uh, You have no idea. (laughs) 10 months of just maybe not quite 10. It's like nine months of but because they till six weeks after you deliver, but oh my gosh, mm-hmm. I'm I'm really excited to not get injections right now. So that's it. The end is near. Yeah. So I will do yeah. that one more time. I think, <laughs> and I then I think I might be done. Yeah. Well, is there anything else that we didn't? talk about that you wanted to share? No, it's just it's so great processing everything and, (laughs) you know, and hearing about it because I blinked and it's been six weeks. Yeah. So yeah, it's just it's just nice to to process and talk about. So yeah, that's been enjoyable and informative. So yeah, and now you get to listen to it again. Yeah. (laughs) You have it forever. Exactly. It's recorded now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Anna, thank you so much for sharing all this with me. Absolutely. I look forward to watching this little nugget grow. Yeah, I'll just send, I'll, yeah. Little, this yeah, big he, nugget. He's happy. <laughs> I'll definitely have to send some pictures. Oh, well, thank you so much. Let's face it. Moms are busy. We're so busy taking care of others that we rarely have time to take care of ourselves. I'd love to simplify that for you. I'm offering a free 15-minute hair care or skin care consult to help you find an uncomplicated routine using clean, vegan, anti-aging hair care and skincare products that follow the strict EU standards for safety. For your free consult, just send me an email at birthjourneysrn at gmail.com and we'll schedule a call. I'm excited to be a part of your self-care journey. Thank you so much for tuning into my podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on future episodes. Don't forget to share the podcast with a friend who can benefit from the valuable insights that we share here. And if you could take a moment to leave a five-star rating and review, it would mean the world to me. If you're ready to work one-on-one with me to embark on a transformational journey towards a confident and empowered hospital birth experience, go to kellyhoff.com backslash empowered and enroll in my Empowered Hospital Birth Coaching Program. Together, we'll create a roadmap to a birth experience that you'll cherish forever. That's K-E-L-L-Y-H-O-F dot com backslash empowered. Let's make your birth experience extraordinary.